prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, Noah, his wife, his three sons and their, their wives, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, immersion, not the removal of filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of, of Yeshua, the Messiah. So let me break that down very briefly. This incident in Noah, where God provided a, a, a salvation tool, a favorable tool, which is the ark, to get them through, to save them physically, was like their immersion. It was like their baptism. Baptism is symbolic of cleansing of filth and cleansing of dirt, whether it's spiritual or physical. Baptism physically cleanses the dirt. Baptism in the time of Noah, in the ark, cleansed the world from all of its sinfulness. Baptism today is symbolic of our cleansing that has happened through the work of Yeshua. It was their favorable act, and it is our favorable act also. This is the ultimate act of favor that God has actually forgiven us. Because Yeshua talks about two types of baptisms. The baptism of, of water and spirit, which is the cleansing physically, excuse me, the cleansing spiritually, and then a baptism of fire, which is reminiscent of how you would purify certain metals uh, and how you purify certain metals to get rid of the impurities. This object of favor, we need to ask ourselves again, are we stewards of it? Or are we squanderers? First thing, do we accept that Yeshua died for us? Because if you squander that one, we don't have any more questions. If you squander that one, you don't accept it. But if you're a steward of it, there's more to the question. The continual favor that we are given every day because of what Yeshua did for us, are we stewards of it? Or do we squander it? Do we make God proud? Or do we make him sad? Do we tell others about him? Or do we keep him to ourselves? Noah and his family went through the immersion, the, mikv the mikvah. God cleansed the world from filth. We are also cleansed by this act of favor. So what is our response? This is a question we need to ask. How does it apply to me? What do we do when we get God's favor? Personally. What do you do when you get a raise? Do you give it to God? Do you give some of it to God? Do you think it's because of you? Or is it a mixture of everything? Is it because of God? What do you do when you are shown love or adoration from your husband or your wife or Maybe someone who you want to be your husband or your wife. Don't take these things for granted. Let God be in all of this. This is favor. What do you do when you're recognized at work? What do you do when God keeps you from making a big mistake? From chatting online with that woman that you know you shouldn't be chatting with? Or from having an affair? Or from cheating on your taxes? Or what if you've made one of these huge mistakes and God still shows you favor through the forgiveness of a loved one? Are you going to squander it or are you going to savor it? Are you going to steward it? Do I squander what God has given to myself and my wife and my future son through friends, through financial supporters, or am I a steward of it? And sometimes I've been both, and I'll admit that. And uh, this is why it's so convicting this morning. So how are we to respond? And we'll close with this. How are we to respond when God gives us his favor and grace through Yeshua and also in every other little way that we can think of? And I would encourage you, as we're reading this last passage, to think about the ways that may be that you may normally forget or you may normally um, ignore. God shows us favor in all little ways, 
all sorts of little ways. Yes, there are things that we have to suffer through sometimes, but that's not what this message is about. This is about how we respond to God's favor. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Let's just start in 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love with one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Messiah Yeshua, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Messiah's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. The reason we cannot be squanderers is because the world needs to know. The reason we can be stewards and we should be stewards is because we have a hope beyond all hopes. The first, op the first opportunity to steward God's favor is simply to acknowledge that you have sinned and you need salvation. And the only way to do that is through Yeshua. But then, because this verse is just like the rest of the world, after we've accepted that, we're still here in a world that is technically damned by sin. And yet, people are going down in flames unless we respond to God's grace by giving him credit, by telling people about him, by ministering to each other. So when we encounter other issues, even though we've already received favor from God, we already expect that. Why? Yeshua suffered it, the prophets suffered it, and we know this, this earth is going to fail. We know it. So it's not unexpected. But we need to respond as stewards of the gift of grace, of favor that we have been given. Romans 6, 1, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul says, may it never be. Israel, or actually before Israel, they did a horrible job of God's grace, with God's grace. First, Adam and Eve, they squandered it. But God had favor on them, didn't kill them, but sent them out of the garden as a punishment. Then the world was populated, and they became evil, and God saved humanity through Noah and his family, but God also cleansed the world. There was a punishment, but there was also favor. So you think after those two things, the people would learn. I mean, did you know that Noah and Adam, according to Jewish tradition, were contemporaries? They lived at the same time. And Noah also lived at the same time as the Tower of Babel, because that happens at the end of this parasha. You would think it's only 300 years since the flood, according to Jewish tradition. Noah's still alive, okay? But the people, and the, the, you know, again, Jewish tradition, they say given a birth rate of 3.4 kids, uh, 920,000 people populate the earth. So a significant population after the flood, they try to build a tower to God because they want to be just like him. My people, the people of this Bible, the people of our book have continually squandered the word, but God is favorable. God is graceful to us. He's gracious. What will we do? Will we be stewards or will we be squanderers? So I encourage myself and I encourage all of you to think differently about what we have been given, to think more about the favor we've been extended than the obstacles put in our way, 
and choose to show everyone that God is good and God is favorable. Avinu Vimalkeno, our Father and King, we thank you and we honor you for this, this reading today, this parasha, reminding us that you are indeed graceful and favorable, but you will also not stand uh, face to face with sin. You will put it down. Whether we deserve it or not, Lord, we are thankful for your favor. And we pray that we would make you proud, that we would not lose the opportunities to make the most of your favor and your grace. We pray for the people in this community that they would also respond to your grace and favor in part due to us. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Thank you, Ryan. Um, very provoking message. And I think it's uh, something that we should all reflect on and ask God to show us what we need to learn from that. Um, Ryan is a support raised missionary and so we are going to take a love offering for him there's a basket on the back table by the Sadaka box and for those of you who know what the Sadaka box is but for those of you who don't we don't pass a basket around here for services we have a box that we collect our tithes and offerings through so if the Lord has uh, laid it on your heart to bless our congregation and that's where you would do that and also I would uh, ask you to uh, bless Ryan for his ministry, what God's going to be doing through him and his wife, Jessa, and uh, in the Washington, D.C. area, ministering to the college kids in this area. How important is it that we get people while, uh, while they're young to understand God? Because statistically, some of you may have sat through the rabbi's class that has talked about this. Once a person reaches a certain age, statistically the the reality of them becoming a believer diminishes every year so in the first 25 years of someone's life if they hear the gospel and they learn about God they're more receptive to receive God and to become a believer but after 25 and when you get to the 30s and 40s it's less than 5% chance that they will become a believer now God is sovereign and we know that that's true but human condition is, you know, our, our flesh and also the way that we receive things and how people perceive things. It's different as you get older. So this ministry is very important. And how important for the leaders, the stupid but brilliant leaders that he talked about, that we would uh, reach out to those Jewish kids that need to know the Messiah, that they are the future leaders of this world, and also for the Christian kids that they would understand that they need to bless Israel and they need to love Israel and love the Jewish people. So please, please um, put uh, a lovely offering in the, ba in the basket for them to bless them in their ministry because we believe it, we support it, and hopefully sometime we will be able to partner with them to do some things in the local area. And we will invite you guys to do that too. We do have a video um, that I want to play um, and it goes very well with, with Ryan's message about squandering God's grace and how important it is that even though we may squander the, the, the joy that we have, that we know that God still loves us. Doesn't mean that we should squander it, but praise God that he is not reliant on us, that he is sovereign and that he loves us anyway and that grace is always there and always available.